just briefly, I would like, as part of the Mises Institute, to thank you again for your coming. Uh, many of you uh, suffered the uh, indignities of a hurricane to get here, and we definitely appreciate your presence. That's the last nice thing I'm going to say. <laughs> Um, first, I had two jokes, and Lou won't let me tell them. So the first one, what I'll do is I'll make it politically correct. But you're, it, Well, I could say it. It's originally a Polish joke, but he won't let me tell them. So I've changed it, and it goes as follows, that there are there's these three neocons. <laughs> And they're terrorists, and they take over a U.S. submarine, and they take it out to sea, and they're holding the submarine and the, and the crew hostage. And they make their final offer, and their final offer is $2 million of Confederate money and three parachutes. <laughs> Originally, the joke was $2 million Zlotys and three parachutes, but of course... Uh, I'm going to tell the other one, too. <laughs> this is um, any feminists in the room might object, but what the heck. Seems this fellow is speeding along the highway, and a highway patrol flashlights going and sirens turning, and they pull him over, and the policeman says to him, Sir, your wife fell out of the car eight miles back. And the fellow says, What a relief. I thought I was going deaf. <laughs> <laughs> you should have heard the original of that before he made me change it. <laughs> Let's talk about gold. My original topic was uh, Murray Rothbard, and but I'm sure Murray will allow uh, me to, to to change the subject a little tonight. Uh, we had a bad day yesterday, uh, us gold bugs. Uh, we had uh, two of the people I m have enormous esteem for. Jim Grant is one of my heroes, and uh, Dr. Friedberg, uh, the most generous host and fellow and gentle fellow I've maybe ever met. I was going to, I'm going to savagely attack both of them for for uh, their attitudes about the gold, and and uh, I really was going to do a, uh, a rather direct uh, criticism of them both. But we had a better day today. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Hopper and Walter Block uh, present uh, gold in a more historic and abstract manner, and uh, I'm not as angry. <laughs> and in analyzing the situation, what I decided is that uh, on the first day, uh, Jim Grant and uh, Dr. Friedberg, these are people, you might say, in the real world. They are dealing with problems and investment day-to-day, uh, -day, whereas uh, today uh, we had a more academic, historic evaluation of it. And uh, as I say, that made me feel a bit better. Uh, one of the things that was most interesting was the agreement by almost everybody that th there's a balloon out there, and this balloon is uh, at, at best uh, fictional or artificial and at worst immoral, and that it's going to burst. I think there was total agreement, and not surprisingly from from speakers of our from our view. Yet nobody seemed to follow that. At least on the first day, they didn't. Uh, what is what does the burst of a balloon mean? Does it mean twenty percent down in the Dow Jones averages? Does it mean uh, an increase of un uh, in a, unemployment? Does it mean bankruptcies? I mean uh, the, the ramifications. Uh, for, particularly for those uh, of the Austrian view of a market break, a proper market break, no one knows where that would go, and I'll deal with that a little later. A gold dealer, you might say, is a halfway house uh, between the real world and the abstract. And uh, in a way, I've been operating a sort of a halfway house for, for 40 years. Uh, 
we have a myopic view. Ours is not dealing with the whole person. We're not interested in their uh, how they made their money or or uh, what their other investments are or what kind of retirement programs they've they've uh, they've uh, they have. We're we're really concerned with uh, potential disaster. I mean that's what it's all about in in the current situation. Gold is a fever thermometer. Uh, telling us how sick we are, and uh, uh, that's that as it's that aspect of people's lives that we're dealing with. Some of our customers are very articulate about it; others are not. But uh, they all come from the same uh, view. And I'll just briefly tell you about a conversation I had with a customer on the phone. To profile, seventy years old, retired, and we were chatting a few moments and. And about, about ten minutes into the conversation, his wife was on the line on the extension. Not to, I, I wasn't aware of it. In the old days, you could tell when someone was on the extension. You you can't do it today. And I was surprised, and we hadn't I hadn't told any of my bad jokes, so it was okay. Uh, but the, she she was a little critical. She asked me a question, and pretty soon they were kind of having a fight. And I'm holding the phone, and I didn't know what to do. And so I excused myself, and the last thing I heard was something to the effect that the girls at the Bridge Club had an investment portfolio, and they're up about 800% uh, dot com this and whatever that, and this dummy husband of hers is buying gold at a 26-year low. That was effectively what she had to say. So he called me back in about an hour, and I said, how did you handle that? She said, gee whiz. He said, oh, she's a sweetie pie. No, she's not a sweetie pie. She wasn't very nice at all, but he was nice. He said, she, he, he said I explained some time ago to her that, and I'm speaking for him now, somewhere along the way he came upon a body of knowledge, an understanding of the world, that, that he found rational, he found moral, he found historically valid. He also had great respect for the people. Uh, whether it was the Rothbards or the, the, the Mises or the newsletters, or ha however he came to it, he found it an appealing view. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it took him out of other things. He no longer could comfortably invest in other areas. He wasn't comfortable with the stock market, and and uh, uh, he was uh, uh, really uh, taken out of those other alternatives. He never had to wake up in the morning and say, uh, uh, shall I buy a share of Amazon.com or an ounce of gold? Or the, He did not face those circumstances. He had no bitterness, unlike me. I have a lot of bitterness about our enemy. I, I'd like to see them suffer as we have for recent years. Uh, he had none of that. He knew in his heart that he would prevail, that the truth and morality of what his position was Ultimately, it might not, might not happen in his lifetime. He recognized that. He knew how powerful the forces were. It was just interesting that he represented something that many of my customers have. It's a viewpoint. It's more, and it's moral. It's a moral position. And when Murray wrote his book, The Ethics of Liberty, that's, that's what's really important. There is an ethic to our view. Have, setting that aside, that was just a, uh, there's a history that, uh, that, my friends, uh, the realists, the uh, Dr. Friedberg and, and Jim Grant, they really don't go into the history of the, the modern gold market. Modern in the sense that from 1931, uh, 32 or 33 actually, until 1974, gold was illegal. And as someone discussed today, it was as Walter Block, it was almost as dangerous as smuggling heroin. In fact, in San Francisco, the feds raided a money changing house because of just with flak jackets and just unbelievable. So this was because they had some hundred krona gold coins. Uh, I mean, the, the government was very clear about its attitude toward gold. The king doesn't want you to know the value of an ounce of gold because if you do, you know what mischief he's been up to. So the king is very powerful, and, and making it against the law is about as powerful as you can do it. From 1974 until about 1981, there was relative freedom. We didn't monetize it, Hans, but there was relative freedom in the gold market. Uh, people could, there was no, there was whatever government influence 
there was put on uh, upon the price of an ounce of gold was ineffective. And that's why the gold reflected every, you voted no every time you bought an ounce of gold. And if you had a little war someplace, we used to, in the trade, say, well, that something would spill over in the Middle East and say, that's a $12 war, meaning that we knew it would react. And then, I guess it was Paul Volcker who instituted a new policy in 1981, 82. Murray Rothbard once said of Paul Volcker, he never trusted anybody that was six foot seven. And I... <laughs> And w without going into the devices that they used, they effectively, from 1982 to the present, have learned how to control the price of an ounce of gold. There's no ands, ifs, or buts. So anybody who looks to things like the dumping of gold, the disgorging on the part of central banks, I mean, that's all, the, 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 the game is a rigged game. Uh, uh, the best evidence recently, uh, this was, I think, the price of gold got to my experts from the commodities market. I think it got to 291, and the very next day they announced the uh, UK gold sales. I mean, that was just as blatant, uh, in our view, uh, of the effort that they have to control. So, if, if Jim Grant, who was just uh, frustrated by these markets. He just couldn't understand it. There's no frustration. It's, it's absolutely controlled and directed. and So it's a fixed game, and you shouldn't be disappointed. Well, why in heaven's name, then, would you would anybody buy gold? I mean, given the nature... Well, back to my friend on the telephone. Uh, he has this view of the world that makes him comfortable, that's moral. He buys gold. There's also an impatience about us in these markets today. For one-third of my career, the gold was $35 an ounce. Now, it's true, we really had no expectations. The philosophy was there. We knew that one day things might change. I remember a dinner party we had uh, when gold went to $100 an ounce. This was a celebration. Unfortunately, by the time we had it, it was back to 86 So it wasn't exactly the celebration of $100. But, I mean... Everybody is moving at such a pace. Llewellyn Rockwell wanted to send me some email. I said, I don't have an email, but I have a fax. And Lou said, fax. Fax is like getting a letter delivered by horseback. That's what, that's what he said. It's a certain charm about getting a letter delivered by horseback. Problem might be solved by the time you get the letter. No, there is an impatience. Uh, now, 20 years is a long time to be in a bear market, and, or a contrived bear market, or a controlled bear market. But, but uh, that's the way it is. And if you view gold not as investment, because that's the wrong way to view it, it's an extension of your savings. It's a, a hedge. It's a, um, an insurance, or it just makes you feel good, or it, or it gives you something that if you're a masochist, it gives you something to suffer with all the time. But then there's there's other events that come to mind, and this is pretty grim. Is everybody finished with their food? This is this is grim stuff. Uh, I have recollections, recent recollections, not of Indians from the Amazon washing their clothes in the river or uh, African natives uh, cannibalizing each other. I have recollections of a train leaving the Berlin station. A uh, couple of months before the Berlin Wall came down. I don't remember the exact circumstances, but things were very bad in East Germany, and the Czechs of all people had set up a place where some of these trains, and as the trains left the station, the people were throwing the paper money out the window. That's something I will not... And again, these were real people. These were you're like us. They weren't from another planet. Another recollection is uh, shortly before the, the fall of the Soviet. One of the most dramatic things is they demonetized a thousand ruble note on a Friday. Imagine that. You've worked and you've saved and, 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 and you've got these notes that are money or they're a promise and you're told that they're worthless. I mean, these are pretty savage things to happen to people. Back in, in uh, someone brought up the Mexican situation in 1982, uh, just briefly, in Mexico, they don't have an extensive middle class as we do, but they have a professional class. They have doctors and lawyers, and anybody in Mexico 
never saves in Mexican pesos. Never ever saves. You you live in Mexican pesos. You pay your bill, but any reserves you have is you do something else with. And historically, the, this these professionals always held U.S. dollars. That was their their goal, and they did very very well. Every time there was a cataclysm in Mexico, about every decade, the poor poor get poorer and the, those who are professionals managed to get richer. They always profited, except in 1982. What happened there, although you didn't have a change of government, it was the same party, you did have a change of something, a new president, and they what, what they did is they confiscated the dollar accounts, all of the dollar accounts in Mexico, and they converted them over a period of a couple of weeks at the official exchange, and you lost about 90% of your of your assets. So here was another instance of people who, if they, now their best choice would have been if they'd had Swiss francs until April of, of 82 and then switched them over to the dollar by November. But that's crazy. People aren't trading. So some of our younger people maybe have the, that kind of alacrity, but as you get older, you lose some of those skills. By golly, gold is is a money, is a historic money, and in this instance, these people, those who had gold did survive that. They didn't have an easy time of it because uh, there were fears that the gold would be called in as well. You, now, you don't need, and Y2K, now we're concerned about Y2K. I don't know my, I don't even know if I have an opinion on the subject. Uh, I don't know enough about computers, but I sure know a little bit about human nature and and if it's people's perceptions of things that are more important than the realities. And I could see a, a housewife going into the, the supermarket and seeing the shelves empty of a, a bottled water, and, and uh, she's not going to do a critical analysis of Y2K. She's going to go to another store and try to buy bottled water. Uh, I could see these things happening. I hope not, but uh, Y2K could uh, reveal other weaknesses or act as a catalyst and uh, so but I think uh, m more relevant is what I call the, the crisis in a person's life there's two kinds of crisis one is a mi I, I, these are my own labels one I label a mini crisis that doesn't mean it's small it means it's you it's divorce it's sickness it's Litigation. It's the IRS. A partner sues you. I mean, these things happen in a lifetime, and and uh, uh, they're not many by any means. But we say it's not a bad idea, maybe to have some gold if you go through a mini crisis. And I'll I'll explore that in a minute. A maxi crisis is happening to everybody. That would be wars and floods and Y2Ks and pestilence and whatever. And once again, these are emergencies that happen. They happen all the time. Uh, there's not a month, well, every other month, I'll get a call from a lawyer. Lawyer representing one of the parties in the divorce. Usually the wife. The contention is that he has assets that he's concealing and gold is easily concealable and, and he's been led to believe that the fellow has gold with us. And of course I discourage that. I say, look, you want to subpoena our books, you can do it. You're not going to learn anything. And, and when it's all over, I'll say to him, you know, off the record, I hope he does have gold. And I hope she has gold too that he doesn't know about. Uh, of course, as a gold dealer, I have a self-interest there, but <laughs> someone brought up the case of the fellow who ran away with, with the diamonds. Well, diamonds are, you know, terrific, and they're a girl's best friend, but they ain't money. They don't have a history of money, and, and gold does. I might add that lawyers, uh, in, in some of these cases, I know these people. They've been, they've been married 30, 40 years, and, and the lawyers get in, and it's just dreadful. Don't, don't get any divorces. I, I, I think it's a bad idea financially. Um, I didn't mean to, to make it a commercial, but but it really is. And uh, we feel a prudent person who understands what's going on, 
has some gold. What's the difference what you're paid for it? All you know is that you have immediate liquidity in, in this market, uh, total privacy, or as close you, as you can come to privacy, uh, and there's no other asset that, that I, I don't think that can, can quite accomplish it as gold. Uh, when you're buying, uh, buy it from a reputable dealer. I once was asked by one of the trade publications to list all of the qualifications that a dealer should have, and of course I described myself. So that was, uh, once again, a little self-serving. But everybody around here has an employee discount, anyone in this room. so. Uh, once again, I thank you all for coming and for being patient, listening to me complain, but we enjoyed having you here, and the, and the, the panels were very, very good today, the best I've ever attended. Thank you very much.